Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by... Hey there, this is Colby Trax. I know, but this time you've got it all down. Blah, 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 Isaac Saracen, blah, 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 girl, girl, computer, computer, thing, thing. Okay, I know you have that all that out. What I'm asking is a little bit of help here. See, I record a lot of stuff, and I sometimes don't pay as much attention to quality as I should, or because I hear it all the time, I just can't hear it. Hey, I've said these words many times already. Okay, so what I need from all of you, it's really awesome, is just if you find an error in a track, something's wrong, bad bad uh, bumper, bad something, just send me either a tweet at Twitter, at Colby Tracks, C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X, or send me an email at colbytracks at colbyjack.net. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X at colbyjack.net. Or if you can't remember any of that, just send me an email at b at colbyjack.net. That's B, the letter B, and then the at symbol, and then colbyjack.net. If any problems, any errors, just send me the information. I'll fix it as soon as possible, get it back up, because this is how this thing gets better, is we work together. Oh, yeah, and make sure and tell me what time in the track, you know, what track and what time it is. And everything will be cool. You know, I'll let you go back to whatever the boop dee 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 thing he's going to say next. Something about uh, what happens when everything you do has been recorded by the keylogger. Okay. Have a nice one. Bye. What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger. Episode 36, 01-01-10, Ishmael. Fatima sat in his boxers on the edge of his bed. I sat on top of a stack of scavenged computer parts on the floor next to his SenseNet rig and chair. My cameras, a pair of cheap chat cameras sold at every bodega in the city, sat arranged on curio shelves on adjoining walls. From one camera, I could see out the window onto the rooftop of an industrial warehouse turned farm next to our building. The other camera gave me a view down the length of Fatima's apartment, from beside the door, across the living room into the galley kitchen. At the edge of my vision, I could just make out the outlines of the doors into the bathroom and single bedroom. I stopped myself. I had to remember that Fatima's names were dependent on situation. In the world of flesh, when she is out of her feminine attire, Fatima had instructed me to call him Ibn. I would have given him a look of confusion if I had a face in the world of flesh. The name Ibn meant son of in Arabeya. I didn't think this was a real name. Fatima, sorry, Ibn, had spoken softly, his voice barely audible to the microphones Ibn had placed around the apartment so I could hear him. It is from an old movie. An Arab of the ancient caliphate was forced into exile because of a sin. The barbarian Northman he traveled with didn't speak his language and misinterpreted the repeated saying of Ibn as he said his complete lineage as his name. Was he the hero? I asked. I listened through my microphones to my voice as it came from a series of cheap wireless speakers attached to the ceiling with double-sided sticky tape. The level sounded good. I was definitely figuring out how to sound human without any of the normal equipment. Ibn didn't answer me as he moved randomly about the apartment, picking up the naturally occurring litter which builds up in any living space. I decided I would have to watch that film at my earliest convenience. I really need to understand what made Ibn, ni Fatima, ni Mohammed Jordinia tick. I knew the word ni meant a maiden name in Francois, but alias didn't cover the levels of meaning implied with each of Ibn's names. He wore like the layers of an onion. Ibn's names weren't pseudonyms used to hide identity. Each of Ibn's names was an identity. Mohammed. Jordania, was a former upstanding member of the community of believers in the Abedini ghetto of Little Russia. When he revealed his identity as Fatima to his family, only his oldest son, Jacob, had lived up to the levels of acceptance the Abedini preached as their core precept. The remainder of the beleaguered community of believers turned on their beloved Dr. Jordania soon after. This almost broke the faith of Mohammed Jordania. For if the lowest of believers in one of the roughest Abedini slums couldn't accept the different among them, what hope was there for the body of believers as a whole? Fatima then abandoned her identity as Dr. Jordania and drifted from neighborhood to neighborhood. 
Initially, Fatima cashed in favors earned for assisting the wounded and dying of the city's underworld. She had almost completely abandoned her faith at that point when she heard there was an Abedini professor at an expensive private school in the boroughs searching for an Abedini doctor with experience with street medicine. Fatima couldn't remember where she first heard the rumor. It might have been in one of the thousands of fringe coffee shops where the faithful, pagan and unbelievers mixed without regard to social norms. It might have been through a corner drug lord who ruled her neighborhood as if it were a literal fiefdom. Or it could have been from the backstreet prostitutes, who she doctored as a bit of charity from one of the poorest to one worse off than she. She had a soft spot for the prostitutes of the back alleys. Many were boys who should have still been in school. Many reminded her of her own sons, and she wept soft tears with them as he recounted the abuse the worst Janes heaped on them. Then one day the rumor had caught up with Fatima. In a dark alley, as she arranged for a boy not yet a man to receive a pauper's cremation, the professor from the Eastern College found her. Fatima never learned her name, for it was a woman. Of this Fatima was sure. Fatima never saw her face. The professor wore a burqa as all-encompassing as the one which protected Fatima's identity. They had stood talking in the alley, which had only recently been the last resting spot of a young prostitute whose only crime had been running into a group of drunken factory women who had their own theories on how he should have performed. The professor wanted to know if Fatima had dealt with any cases of implant failure in otherwise healthy individuals. Fatima had told the woman she had on many occasions, with the latest being the most perplexing. I had waited, as Fatima explained to me why Isaac's case was so strange. Isaac's damage came in three forms, according to her scans of his brain. The first was an allergic reaction which she had expected, and which should have responded to steroid treatments or even anti-rejection drugs. They hadn't. It was as if something in Isaac's implants were counteracting the effects of the drugs on the brain. The second was physical trauma. Some of the damage around the implants was consistent with cutting. It was as if a very small, nano-scale knife had been used to sever connections between synapses within three microns of the implants. The damage wasn't restricted to the sites where the implants interfaced with the skull, but were present all along every connection and wire within Isaac's brain. The most interesting aspect of the damage wasn't the severity. The most interesting aspect was the fact that nowhere along the length of the implant network had the cuts ever interfered with the operation of the implants themselves. Fatima was at a loss as to how the damage could have happened. It was almost as if the implants, as extruded claws along its length, slashed into the surrounding neural connections and then retracted mysteriously back into the implant structure. While it was possible for a medical implant to contain shape-shifting elements similar to certain models of firearms, no one had ever bothered to implant them into a medical implant to the best of Fatima's knowledge. Though, she would be the first to admit that there was always the possibility someone had made such a device. She also didn't know why they would bother. A harmful device didn't make sense. Then finally, there were the neurotoxins. Late in Isaac's day at the Amazov catfish farm, Fatima had found the presence of a neurotoxin in his cerebral fluid. The toxin was slow-acting, with its primary effect being a deadening of synaptic responses followed by coma. How the toxin was present was something Fatima couldn't explain. The neurotoxin was a waste product of the Clostridium type of bacteria. This was a family which included botulism, tetanus, anthrax, and diphtheria, most of which would have killed Isaac within a day or two of contracting it. This variety appeared weaker than normal, almost as if it had been manufactured to work slower. What bothered Fatima the most about it was how it had arrived in Isaac's skull. Isaac's diet and contact with others had been tightly controlled for weeks. The only way Isaac would have been in a more tightly controlled environment would have been if he had been in an isolation ward at a major hospital. Even that point could be argued if one thought about the army of support personnel Isaac would have come in contact with even in isolation. Fatima had relayed this information to the secretive researcher from a college far away who had asked for Isaac's medical records. Fatima responded that she had them but not with her. If the woman wanted them, she could either accompany Fatima to her apartment 
or give her a contact address, and she would forward them at her earliest convenience. The woman refused to follow Fatima, and instead gave her an address within V-City to drop off the files. The woman had asked that Fatima encode them, using al talak 652 from the Igrish Quran, Abramov translation as the key. I had asked Fatima the importance of the passage. She responded by quoting it. And whosoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, he will make a way for him to get out from every difficulty. Later, once Fatima had entered V-City and found comfort in the company of the faithful, she would learn that the address the secretive researcher had given her was an anonymous dropbox maintained on a server in Switzerland by an organization known as the Gnomes of Zurich. She had hoped it was secure, and I informed her that it was the most secure data storage in the world. I didn't know for sure, but I believed even Koenig and his AIs of Star X would have trouble gaining access. Though I could be wrong. Thanks to the strange woman requiring her to drop the data into the V-City, Fatima was able to restart her career as a doctor. And while her needs were not great, she was able to provide for Mohammed Jordania's family. But isn't that your family? I asked at this point in the story. They are, but they aren't. I am leaked by genetics to them, and I love them all. But their mother has made it clear I am no longer welcome to see them. My son, Jakob, is my only child old enough to disobey their mother, and even he must sneak around or risk angering her. He is a man, and yet he must lie to his mother in order to see his father. So, for all practical purposes, I am no longer Mohammed Jordania. When I wish to live in my own skin in the gender of my birth, I now go by Ibn. In a city with few who know Arabaya, it is a simple and good name. Ibn had related to me as he sat in his boxers and contemplated the wall. What am I supposed to do next? I asked. Ibn, Fatima, Dr. Muhammad Jordania had demanded that I lived in only one place. He demanded that I lived as a man who made his own way in the world and paid my own way. I had not been prevented from engaging in criminal activity for so long. I was at a loss as to what I should do next. You need to find a job, Eben said as he stood up stiffly from the bed and waddled toward the tiny apartment's even smaller bathroom. I had imagined Fatima, sorry, Eben, as someone closer to my own age, not someone a decade and a half older, not someone whose legs drew stiff and needed to waddle to get them moving. But then again, Eben did have a son, Jakob, who was in medical school. The math worked. Sounds like something you'd tell your son, I responded. I did. Eben called from the bathroom over the sound of urine striking water. Now it's your turn. Okay, Dad. I teased. So, what do you think I should do? Deliver pizzas? I thought computer geeks did all their work through the net. Couldn't you get a job doing something with servers or databases or something? Eben asked as he ran through his ablutions. There's not much available legally for someone without documentation. Honestly, the city requires ID numbers for everything. I can't even get a bank account without an ID, and I can't get a job without having a bank account. And besides, Dad, I can't get an ID because I'm trying to do everything all nice and legal like you asked me to. I answered. I think I sounded petulant, because Eben made a psha sound, and then jumped in the shower. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the firmware pathology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where firmware proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of firmware hijack. So you haven't heard or read firmware hijacked or proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to colbyjack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and Smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C O L B Y T R A X. 
I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast, while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm ColbyTrax, that's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week.